I will firstly introduce Laura. So Laura Nolan is a software engineer with 15 years experience in the tech industry. Laura recently resigned from Google in protest over its involvement with the US's Department of Defense's Project Maven. So with that, I'll hand it over to Laura. Thank you very much. Okay, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Okay, is that working? Can everyone see my slides? Yeah. Excellent. Good. Okay, well, thank you for having me here. Um, so, um, since I'm going first, uh, I'm going to sort of just introduce the topic of autonomous weapons. Um, so hopefully, hopefully none of you know too much about them already, or you may be bored. I'm also going to sort of tell my story of how I got involved with a campaign to stop killer robots. So, here's Antonio Guterres, um, the UN Secretary General, and um, this is his very, very strong and opinionated tweet about autonomous weapons. Um, I like this slide because it sort of explains why they are and why we should oppose them. So, an autonomous weapon is, um, is any weapon that has the power to select its own target. And these, these weapons could come in various sorts of form factors, like very quickly, people will think of drones, people will think of Robocop, people will think of Terminator, um, but you know, there's also submarines and there's also all sorts of small drone form factors. And these things could look like all sorts of things quite frankly. Um, you know, the, the, and quite frankly, the, the reason that I uh, object to these weapons is that they throw up so many, so many moral problems. And as a technologist, they throw up a huge, huge host of technical challenges as well, and technical challenges that I don't think most people, and fortunately I don't think most politicians who are in favor of these weapons actually understand the, the sheer difficulty of building these kinds of systems in, in any sort of responsible way. I mean, in fact, I do not think that there is a responsible way to build these kinds of systems. So let me, um, yep, yeah, so I'm a computer scientist, I'm a software engineer, I have a day job in software at the moment. Um, I mostly specialize in distributed systems and reliability, um, so essentially keeping websites up, big complicated websites. I'm a member of an NGO called iCrack, and I'm also studying ethics at the moment, halfway through my master's degree. So this is the logo for a thing called Project Maven or the algorithmic warfare cross-functional team of which Project Maven was their, their first and most famous project. So the little Latin motto means something like, we're here to help. And uh, there's a, I, I don't know whether the person who designed this rather fantastic logo for killer robots um, actually actually meant to, to hark back to the phrase, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, but uh, either they have zero sense of irony or all of the sense of irony in the world. Either way, it's, it's a marvelous logo. So what is this thing? And what have I got to do with it? So 2017, this guy, Robert Bob Burke, uh, as he's normally known, is the deputy US Secretary for Defense and he establishes this thing. Uh, and essentially it's because uh, with current, current procurement processes and the current sort of state of um, the US government's involvement and the US military's involvement in technology, they feel that they have fallen behind private industry, um, in particular, your, you know, your big, your Googles, your Palantars, your Microsofts, all of these kinds of uh, companies. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring the DOD, the US Department of Defense, up to speed in terms of big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all of these hyped buzzwords that we have these days. And so what it, what it turned to first was taking um, drone, camera footage, so what's called wide area uh, motion imagery, which is video taken from high-flying drones in a particular format, and turning these into actionable intelligence and in insights. And of course, what actionable intelligence and insights means is, who do we blow up? Um, then they're moving into other defense mission areas, and you know, God knows what that could mean. It could be anything. So, okay, so action turning computer vision um, algorithms into actionable intelligence and insights. Um, what's this got to do with me and what I was working on? So, um, I was working for Google at the time and I was asked to contribute to this project in slightly in a roundabout way. I wasn't asked to be one of the developers um, on Project Maven and people very often think I, I was because of my involvement in the protest against it. But what I was asked to do was essentially to help Google make it so that they could run these workloads. So, 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 so to get the, the right certifications to run um, high classified workloads in Google Cloud. 
And that was important to the DOD and important to Google for you know commercial reasons and for um, and and for, for this sort of goal that the DOD had of getting private sector technical expertise into in, into their uh, into their processes. But it's it's an it's a morally objectionable project, right? I mean, we are talking a kill chain project here. We're talking a, a project that exists in order to more efficiently process video so that you can figure out who who where where you where you should target your strikes, right? Um, this is what they're using it for. Uh, they, and this this project is up and running at this point. Two years later, Google pulled out of it, but other um, other other companies have stayed in. And, and this is, is up and running. They've um, it, 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 this is this is a project that exists in order to to kill more people more efficiently. Should the need arise, this is this is not a sort of a innocent machine learning um, video analysis uh, harmless project. And and there's a big pretty big controversy about this at the time. Um, one of the other problems that I have with this project is if you get to the point where you can analyze drone video. And get to the point where you can pick out the, mo the, the, the movements of people and, and vehicles and sort of piece together these, um, these sequences of these patterns of life activities to try and decide whether somebody is a threat or is not a threat, um, or is a terrorist or is not a terrorist or is a combatant or not a combatant. If you can do that, um, the, next, uh, the next step on that road is, is to give these, the machines more and more autonomy, right? If you can reliably um, put these targeting information or these, these targeting uh, recommendations together, you know, your next, your next step on the road is to, you know, you first, you, you, you tag your data and you present that to human beings and they do the cognitive processes of deciding what's a target and what isn't. Then the next step is you recommend targets and then potentially the next step is you put this in a robot or a drone and it makes its own targeting decisions. This is, this is definitely a step on the road towards more autonomy in, in weapon systems. So uh, we protested against it, myself and many thousands of others of Googlers, and uh, there was quite a big media outcry and I have a kitten walking across my desk, I do apologize. And ultimately Google said, well, this is not worth the trouble and they, they pulled out of the project, or at least they pulled out of doing the second and subsequent part of the project. They stayed in the first 18 month part of it. Um, I left Google as sort of a protest against all this um, before they had made this decision. But Google is not the only, the only sort of contributor, and, and the US DOD is not the only contributor to, to these sorts of weapons. Like I said, autonomous weapons take part, take, take, take many forms. This is a harpy. This is what's called a loitering munition, and it is, um, it's built by the Israelis um, originally, uh, but they've sold it to, uh, to various other countries around the world. What it does is you launch it, and it flies around, and it looks for radar signals. And if the radar signal that it finds is not on a list of known, approved, friendly radar signals, it can essentially dive bomb these things and, and sort of becomes a kamikaze weapon. Uh, now, there are various ver versions of the Harpy or the Harup, the second version of it around, and some of them have more autonomy than others. But um, it started out, the, the first version of this, being able to do this completely autonomously without any permission for a human being to strike. And then they actually, they, they rode back on this, they, they made the Harpy phone home for permission. This is the Russian uh, T-14 Armata tank. This is, um, a the, the Russians are a little bit cagey about exactly how much autonomy this thing has, but it is known that they are working on an autonomous firing capability for this, so the tank would, would be able to decide when, when it should uh, fire. This is uh, one of the most disturbing kind of recent developments that we've seen in, in autonomous weapons or, or toward the path to more autonomy. This is the Kargu. This is built by the Turkish company STS. It's quite small. Uh, it's about 16 kilos, as I recall. It can carry a payload of about a kilo and a half of explosive. Um, and they, when, when they talk about this, they, they talk about it having all sorts of um, autonomous capability to patrol about the place it has. Uh, it has a uh, facial recognition built into it, so uh, in principle, you could you could set this thing up to look for a particular set of individuals that you might wish to uh, to, to to attack. Um, 
this is this is being deployed out on the the Turkish border, a place where it's a little bit difficult to report from and to know exactly what's happening. But this is you know most definitely a cause for concern. Um, so what are the problems with these weapons? Um, I mean, first and foremost, a lot of us ask whether or not it's okay to delegate the authority to kill to a machine. I mean, it's surely the most morally important thing that any human being could ever do. The machines are not what we would call a moral actor. A machine doesn't decide. A human being decides because a human being can, you, you, you can sit here and you can, you can visualize more than one possible thing that you could do next. A machine is doing a pretty deterministic set of actions, right? Uh, you know, even even very complex software is is reacting to 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 what its sensors and what its programming is telling it, right? Um, and it, it's needless to say, you know, machines uh, software as as it, as it currently is, and as as we currently see the development of software, there's no context, there's no judgment, there's no empathy, there's no understanding of anything, but particularly there's no understanding of what it is to be human, meaning of life, um, and then. We kind of come into another question. I mean, traditionally in in war ethics, um, the permission, the 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 moral um, legitimacy of killing comes from the fact that on two sides, each side's soldiers are equally risking their own lives when they participate in conflict. So uh, the soldier's moral authority to kill is, exists partly because of the risk that that soldier takes on themselves as part of conflict. You know, there's a sort of element of um, of reciprocity, and this, and this is an element that when you fight, you're, you're partly fighting in defense. Um, autonomous weapons, they, they sort of bring about this future where, you know, what is the legitimacy of, of killing in war where one side risks, risks no life, um, doesn't, doesn't put themselves in any physical danger, and it's, it's just this, these, these autonomous weapons. It's a really big problem. Then there's technical problems. Um, you know, e even if we decided it was morally okay to have these machines, there's um, you know, a huge number of purely technical um, difficulties with building them. So these are complex systems. Complex systems are systems that react to their environment, that change their environment, and that interact with, with other, other, other systems and other human beings, right? So what tends to happen in these systems is very very quickly the possibility space of the way that the, the system as a whole and the way that the components of the systems um, it grows very large and it becomes very difficult for the people who design and build these systems to uh, to predict how they're going to react i mean a lot of people when, when we talk about um about complex systems we tend, we tend to think about things like the stock market um and i think anyone who's been paying attention to the stock market in the last 15 or so years has noticed uh, this uh, that we have more algorithmic trading. We have robots essentially making stock trades at, at really high speeds. And we also see that, uh, that we have these flash crash phenomena. And what happens in a flash crash is essentially you have these algorithmic trading agents that uh, interact in unpredictable ways and very quickly cause things to sort of spin out of control. And this is sort of characteristic of these complex systems failures that you get this sort of sudden phase change where everything you know, just goes a bit strange. And the way that we deal with it in uh, the stock markets is that we put in a circuit breaker, which is um, if, if any stock uh, drops by a, a certain percentage in a certain period of time, you shut down trading. You sort of let, you sort of give time for things to regain its equilibrium for people who are running these systems to potentially take action as well. Um, there is no way, there's no circuit breaker on a battlefield. Um, if these things are out there, potentially out of reliable communications range, because a lot of the time there, you've, got, you've got radio signal blocking in on the battlefield, and that's a big driver of the desire to have autonomy. There is no, there's no way to tell these weapons to stop, potentially. So that's really, really worrying, right? And um, the other problem as well is, uh, unlike the algorithmic trading um, systems, which tend to be, you know, re reasonably straightforward sort of, um, you know, numerically driven systems, um, although getting more complex as time goes on. Autonomous weapons are very likely to incorporate all sorts of machine learning algorithms to make them work. And those are, those are very, very black box. They're, they, they work in ways that their designers don't actually design per se. You, you, you build a system and you, you train it on input data and input scenarios and you, um, and you check it against another set of input data and input scenarios and you see, okay, well, for, for these scenarios, I'm testing it on, I get an acceptable result. But the world is very big, and you know, warfare in particular is very unpredictable and full of uh, 
full of actors that are trying to subvert um, other actors, right? Um, it's very, very difficult to to fully to give get a fully fully representative uh, test for these kinds of scenarios. I mean, particularly as, as time goes on, you know, think about an autonomous weapon system that may be designed to attack certain classes of um, say uh, marine vessels, but not others. Time will go on, and um, and people will launch or will design new types of ships. And it's entirely possible that uh, one of your new types of ships that you never tested on because it didn't exist yet might be misidentified. So these are the sorts of call of, uh, you know kind of complex systems and black box system issues that we need to think about. Then just laws of armed conflict. Um, these are pretty complicated, and I'm not a lawyer, and Elizabeth is, um, but. Um, very, very, very quickly, like some of the big problems with complying with the laws of armed conflict as, as a robot are that you um, you have to calculate proportionality. And proportionality is essentially saying, well, in this attack that I'm making, I'm doing a certain amount of um, damage or potential damage to civilians or civilian infrastructure, but I'm getting, uh, I'm getting a certain amount of military advantage. And proportionality is about weighing those two things. So you should not make a, an attack that's very damaging on civilian infrastructure or civilians. Um, if it's only of low military importance. The problem is um, military importance is not really something that you can objectively measure with numbers. Um, and you know, civilian infrastructure damage as well can be, it, it's context dependent, right? I mean, if you live in, for example, um, a very dry country and you start destroying the, the, the water treatment works, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty damaging, right? Would your algorithm understand that? Maybe not. So proportionality is very, very difficult. Um, and then finally, we have this issue automation bias. A lot of people hold up um, this idea that, okay, well, we can build these autonomous systems, but this is fine as long as we keep a human on the loop or a human in the loop, and that human will supervise the, um, the autonomous weapon and um, either stop it if it looks like it's about to do something wrong or give it permission if it, when it asks, right? And these things are often held up as a solution for all this. Um, they, they, they have their own problem. This, 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 this human in the loop or human on the loop has two big problems. The first is um, communications. You may not always have um, reliable communications to your autonomous weapon. So if you're using the intervention model where the human has to intervene because they're on the loop, that may not be reliable. Then the second problem is in automation bias. This is a phenomenon that's been seen in um, whenever people have tried to automate expert systems in medicine or when people have tried to supervise autonomously driving cars, all sorts of places where you're, you're trying to have a human um, interact with a machine as an assistant or or a, a machine that is um, in charge of some process and the human is is uh, supervising it. It doesn't work because humans tend to, we're lazy creatures, you know, our brains switch off. We don't, we don't stay engaged with something unless we're actually driving that process. Um, unless we're really, really cognitively involved. So the, 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 the problem with, with automation bias, and automation bias is not a bi the same as algorithmic bias, where your algorithm is biased against women or against black people or against any other group. Automation bias is simply the human tendency to say, okay, well, the machine thinks that this is true and therefore it's probably true. It's the tendency to overweight um, anything that comes out of a computer. And we see this, we see this always in our lives uh, these days. It's just, like I say, it's been seen in multiple spheres. And there's no reason to think that automation bias will not be seen in military um, autonomous systems, even the ones that are um, supervised by machines. Oh, sorry, supervised by human beings. So very big technical problem here. Nobody has proposed any sort of meaningful solution to this in any of the political processes um, at the UN that I've seen. So a bunch of te technical problems. Um, So fundamentally, the, the sort of the, the conflict that we see is this. Um, on, the, on the one hand, we have a lot of people saying, well, actually, you know, autonomous weapons could be good. They could be better than human soldiers. They could be fairer. They won't get angry and they won't get afraid and they won't, they won't, they won't lash out in, 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 in these sorts of ways. Um, and and, and therefore, therefore, they're better. But uh, it's this sort of this lie that we can sanitize and digitize war with technology and somehow make it more acceptable. It's it's not going to be more acceptable. And I think that the the difficulties and the moral problems with autonomous weapons uh, by far outweigh any any potential good that they could ever do. And I don't think that they're. I, 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 
technology tends to promise a lot and deliver a lot less than the promises in many ways. And I think this would be would be one of these cases. I mean, uh, do I think that the machines, in the battlefield would be fairer or better than humans? I don't. And uh, nobody can prove that they would be. Nobody's attempted to prove that they would be. So moving on, uh, we are on a campaign to stop killer robots. Um, we campaign against these things and we have a page, stop killer robots work that has various ways that you can act and of course I'll be here for questions after the uh, other speakers. Thank you. So thank you Laura. Uh, we next we have the next person Elizabeth Miner who is an advisor at Article 36, an NGO that works to develop new legal standards to prevent civilian harm from weapons and is also a member of the campaign to stop killer robots. So over to you Elizabeth. Thanks so much, Orlando, and uh, thanks, Laura, for a fantastic presentation. Um, and thank you all for having me, and yeah, it's really nice to be on this discussion. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more, uh, building on what Laura was saying, about what the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots is calling for, the current sort of state of international discussion between countries on what they're terming lethal autonomous weapons systems in the international debate, and some of the sort of current legal and political issues around that and prospects for an international treaty, which is what we want. So um, as Orlando said, we're part of the campaign to stop killer robots. We're advocating for an international treaty between states that can prohibit autonomous weapons to help maintain meaningful human control over the use of force and uh, more sort of fundamentally address concerns around human dignity that are generated by the use of increasing automation and autonomy in weapons that Laura was describing. So our immediate objective is, is this treaty, but I think that banning killer robots, it really fits into a much wider range of concerns and values. Um, you know, autonomous weapons, I think, are really the very sharp ends of using advances in data processing and technology to kind of label and categorize people for various ends in ways that can challenge privacy, control of our identities, uh, due process, and you know, the law is a kind of human enterprise um, and our values, which I'm sure Laura and David can talk about with a lot more knowledge from the technical side uh, than me. Uh, but to recap a bit sort of issue wise um, and to build on some of the things Laura was saying, the focus of the campaign and sort of concern um, around these weapons is a broad scope of systems which um, basically apply force through a process of matching sensor inputs to a, a target profile that is encoded in the system without further human action or intervention after these weapons are kind of you know sent off or emplaced or, or activated. So this is the kind of the broad scope of, of systems that underpins current international discussions and the area in which we're looking for regulation and it can be summarized by this diagram that my, my colleague uh, generated. Um, so within a period of time and space where there is no further human engagement with a system apart from perhaps of these intervention protocols Laura was mentioning, um, a system will gather data from its sensors, um, have a process of calculation to uh, determine whether there should be action to apply force based on processing of that data and matching it to a profile of what it should be hitting and then force is applied if the calculation conditions are met. So all these kinds of systems, um, the general challenge with all things in this area uh, is to do with the hi sorry can you still hear me yeah am i am i back sorry i seem yeah okay sorry about that i seem to have a bad bad connection so yeah talking about uncertainty as to um you know where where force might be applied by these systems which poses sort of moral and uh, practical issues these kind of questions of uncertainty include who or what else apart from the unintended target might trigger force in practice. Uh, how can things be reasonably encoded into these systems as targets? So for example, 
is it uh, reasonable at all to kill people based on encoded proxy indicators of themselves, such as their biometrics, reducing people to data points? Is it reasonable to generate target profiles within a weapon system through the machine learning uh, processes Laura was talking about, which we may not be able to fully trace or, or understand as human users? And there's also questions around how can we ensure control that is sufficient within the time and space that the system operates to uphold our ethical principles and permit legal, meaningful legal judgments to be undertaken by weapon system users. So basically there's a, there's a lot of problems in these areas. Um, there's a wide range of weapon systems that already use this type of process to apply force to their targets. So for example, missile defense systems uh, on ships. Um, but what we're sort of worried about is that, um, you know, all, all weapon systems that apply force after their um, emplacement or activation or uh, release uh, might create moral and practical issues. Our concern is kind of with the advancement of systems in this area, with the application of new technologies to give more sophisticated tasks to weapon systems, for weapon systems to therefore operate with lower levels of human involvement and control for kind of longer times over longer areas and to do more things in the ways that Laura was describing. So increasing automation in the use of force. So as a campaign, the sort of core issues that we think need responding to politically in this area are, are some of these ways of applying force fundamentally unacceptable? Um, and uh, we're calling for a treaty that will, um, sorry, and also how can we keep sufficient control over the use of weapon systems? So our sort of overwhelming concern is with further developments in weapon systems that treat human beings as objects and data points to be processed for killing and with losing meaningful, adequate levels of human control over the use of force, uh, which we need in order to meet our current kind of ethical and legal standards. So we're looking for a treaty that will prohibit uh, particularly sensor-based anti-personnel weapons uh, and also prohibit systems that we can't have meaningful human control as we think of it over. For example, uh, because they operate with these black box processes and we don't fully understand how, how, they, might be, how they might operate. We also want a treaty that uh, contains positive obligations on countries to ensure that any systems in this area that they have are subject to meaningful levels of human control. And it's this term, meaningful human control, which the campaign has been using in international discussions to try and focus the debate among states and trying to get discussion on you know what that really means what are the kind of components and principles uh, that we want to see in terms of control over weapon system and the use and force and how can we enshrine these in law and uh, clearly define what it means to meaningfully keep this control over weapon systems so basically uh, we're not focused on the terminator i'm not too worried about the terminator it inevitably accompanies uh, much of our media coverage um, and we you know can be sort of accused or misinterpreted of sort of being a campaign of sci-fi alarmists um, by some serious analysts in this area but this isn't really what we're um, worried about obviously a ban would definitely cover that um, we're really sort of concerned with something which is much more sort of creeping and banal and near future and more in the range of this kind of thing, which uh, Laura mentioned. Uh, this is one of the loitering munitions that was also in her presentation, which can be released over a considerable <coughs> area for a long time to detect targets and detonate against them when it has a match. <clears throat> so the problem isn't something really sci-fi, but something that's basically here now or in the new future, but that has the potential to really change how states and others conduct violence in a way that's very sort of fundamentally troubling and will dehumanize violence even further than, than we already do. So in terms of where we are at the moment in the international diplomatic landscape currently uh, with respect to moving towards an international treaty of the sort that we're calling for, uh, since 2013 the issue of lethal autonomous robots or lethal autonomous weapon systems has been under discussion by states uh, at the UN in Geneva. Uh, first, it was raised at the Human Rights Council, uh, and then it moved under the framework of something called the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, 
Uh, this is a treaty whose mandate is to discuss weapons technologies and apply prohibitions and restrictions to those that are considered you know, particularly unacceptable, particularly because they are indiscriminate or have unnecessarily injurious effects, which are two terms in international humanitarian law to do with the, the regulation of weapons systems. Um, in diplomatic terms, uh, countries have been discussing autonomous weapons there informally since 2014, which means inviting experts to give panels, expressing opinions, but giving no commitments. And then formally since uh, 2017 in um, this particular formation that's called a group of, group of governmental experts. This basically means that uh, countries sort of mandate themselves a few days a year to discuss this particular issue and then rec make recommendations back to their annual conference, which is basically recommending to themselves <laughs> of what they should do next, uh, with options including further discussion, um, negotiating a new legally binding protocol to um, this convention on a particular weapon system, or just um, also other things such as uh, political declarations and, and other moves. Uh, currently, there are low prospects of a legally binding instrument being negotiated in this forum. We're not expecting a treaty to come out of these discussions, which have now been going on quite a long time um, in this particular space. Um, I mean, you might think that this is quite a sort of pressing and important issue. So, so why? <laughs> why is this the case? Um, talking sort of diplomatically and procedurally, uh, the this convention uh, makes decision making by consensus, uh, which though this isn't necessarily in the spirit of the word, this, this has meant that effectively um, some you know, different countries can exercise a veto over any particular activity that they don't like, such as more substantial discussions than just further deliberation on the issue. So several countries are explicitly opposed to a new legal regulation in this area on autonomous weapon systems. Uh, including the United States, Russia, and also the UK. And um, at the CCW, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, um, several of them have you know, acted to kind of block further um, steps towards uh, legal negotiations. So, um, you know, speaking, speaking against this and uh, limiting the kind of outcomes that are agreed on in, in outcome documents. Um, in terms of those who are speaking against uh, legal regulation, there's kind of a range of arguments that are made there. Um, a lot are saying, you know, that we should wait and see how this develops, what will the effects actually be, will it be bad, and we're talking about future systems, so it's premature to do something right now. Uh, others have spoken, you know, actually in favour of, you know, autonomous weapon systems, especially more recently, and proposing the advantages that they might have, including making some proposals that these might be better at protecting civilians and uh, things like this, which I think, as Laura showed, have a lot of you know, technical challenges and um, you know, category errors in, in terms of the law as well. And another argument is that existing legal structures, uh, such as the laws of war themselves and obligations on countries to review new weapons, uh, which are known as Article 36 reviews, will be sufficient to address any emerging issues which we think is incorrect. Um, these review frameworks are very weak and also increasing autonomy presents totally new issues which the law doesn't currently you know, explicitly address in terms of the levels of human control that are needed over weapon systems. So to uphold existing legal principles, we think that new law is, is actually needed. Um, many of the states speaking in favor of a wait and see or other approaches um, or opposing regulation um, are those, you know, considered the sort of major military powers or have domestic uh, weapons industries uh, or are investigating how different aspects of autonomy could give them strategic advantages. Um, one kind of important point here is that it doesn't feel like states have given enough really serious discussion to the risks to strategic stability and security or arms racing of these new developments and there's a need to kind of recenter the debate on what the penalties of this might be rather than just the advantages. Right? Um, around 30 countries have now specifically called for a legal instrument to prohibit autonomous weapons or to maintain meaningful human control over the use of force in, in some other way. Uh, there's been various proposals and support on that put down 
um, including, for example, um, the countries of Austria, Brazil and Chile have proposed there should be a positive obligation on states to ensure human control over weapon systems with autonomous functions. Uh, but basically from this picture at the moment, we can't expect the negotiation of a treaty to emerge from this particular forum. But it doesn't mean there isn't sort of some utility in what's going on. There is definitely an increased recognition amongst states discussing this issue um, that you know, the key area for work is the issue of human control over weapons systems or human machine interaction and how much of it or in what form is necessary. Um, last year, states approved a sort of framework for their further discussions called the Guiding Principles. Um, and so uh, there's an exercise going on in this forum this year for countries to talk about you know, their interpretations of these, uh, one of which uh, refers to human machine interaction in the use of uh, technologies in the area of lethal autonomous weapon systems. So we're sort of um, we're encouraging contributions to this um, and to, you know, for countries to start talking about what concretely they think this should mean, which can give us valuable groundwork for looking at future regulation. So um, this in itself won't result in, in something uh, in, in the immediate term, uh, but it's important to start getting discussion on the kind of content of things to, to move stuff forward. However, I mean, to get the objective of our treaty and to serve the sort of broader goal that it comes under of contributing to values like human dignity and due process and resisting sort of dehumanization and approaching you know, the law as something mechanistic rather than a human enterprise, uh, we'll be needing much more than this and much more than what's going on at the moment and our campaigning and political mobilization will be key so um, as Laura said as well uh, have a look at the campaign uh, find out more and see what you might be able to do to get involved if you're interested uh, thanks I'll leave it there Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. So we have our last speaker, who is David Alexandra Elwood, a theoretical physicist, mathematician, and a member of British Pugwash. David is the former research director of the Clay Mathematics Institute. And so with that, I welcome him into the discussion. Hi there. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I should say straight away, the disclosure that um, I have no background or expertise or technical knowledge about security or international relations or autonomous robots or anything like that. So I'm really here to learn um, as much as um, any viewer of this seminar or webinar is. Um, I'm also a scientist in particular, and I'd just like to start by uh, mentioning one really important point about what a scientist or what science is all about because I have a, a contrarian view of that. Um, you see, um, most of what goes on is not really, what makes progress is not really about technical knowledge or any specific uh, subject knowledge, but it's about generosity and communication. So um, if we don't communicate what we know and share, we don't learn, we don't grow, and uh, we don't participate in events like this. So in particular, as a layperson to the subject, I'm very appreciative to be invited to take part. And, um, and I will share with you uh, some of the thoughts I have on the subject. So um, let me see if I can get my screen to share. Um, I hope somebody will let me know if it works. Okay. I think... Uh, Oops, not working yet. Just a second. I'll present, that must be it. Okay, well, I hope that's working. Um, um, I'm not sure if anybody can let me know, but um, I hope that's working. Um, so let's let's begin. Um, I would like to start by talking about um, bots and then move on to the killing. Um, 
Now, what I think makes uh, killer robots different from other deadly weapons is the idea that we might try to impart them with some form of intelligence. So I thought that uh, maybe my best contribution to the discussion would be to talk a little bit about uh, what I feel about intelligence and how I see intelligence. Well, when I think about intelligence, the first image that comes to mind is one of Albert Einstein. Of course, he was a man of intriguing contradictions, but I think we can agree that he was also extremely intelligent. The other thing that comes to mind is having fun, and fun is a very underappreciated part of gaining intelligence. So um, I thought what I'd do is I'd read you a few lines from the dramatic climax of Ernst Kinoy's play, Dr. Einstein Before Lunch, because it nicely delineates what I think is at stake here. Um, so, in the final scenes of the play, a Mephistophelian character offers Einstein the equation he has sought for the last 30 years of his life. One last great aha. That would interest you. The last equation. The one theory. Suppose, suppose, respected doctor, I could offer you that. Would you like to know it? Einstein asks how he derived his formula from some new mathematics, some new experimental evidence. No, 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 you don't understand. I can make you know. I can offer you knowledge. One moment you will doubt, you will yearn for the answer, and the next moment, aha, you will know. Einstein slowly shakes his head. No, thank you. I beg your pardon? No, thank you, said Einstein. But doctor, I offer you what you have been searching for for 30 years. I offer you the answer to your soul's question. I offer you the confirmation of your faith. Einstein replied, any fool can know. The point is to understand, to follow the thought, to build a structure of theory and mathematics, which is true. That is science. Taking out his wallet, the devilish character replied, but I have it here, a very lovely equation. Einstein said, but I... But would I understand? Would I be able to make it so clear that any scientist would have to agree with me? The devil shrugs. But you would know. No, shakes his head, Einstein. Oh, it has very interesting Greek letters. Einstein still shakes, it still shakes his head. No. But come, doctor, your time approaches zero. You will not find what you are looking for your way. Try mine, holding out his formula. No, accept the gift. Einstein is still shaking his head no. Perhaps what you are looking for cannot be found. Einstein replied, but the important thing is to never stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existence. One cannot help but be in awe when one contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery each day. The devil looks back at his formula. No, are you sure? Einstein replies, no. My God cannot be understood by miracles and blind faith. So, um, unfortunately, um, I can read books about Einstein, but of course I never got the chance to meet the man, the embodied intelligence, which is so important, I think, in this discussion. And um, about uh, one of the very lucky opportunities I had in my life was my first job was at a wonderful institute in France called the uh, Institut des Autitudes Scientifiques. It's um, a very special uh, research institute uh, primarily for physicists and mathematicians. And it was founded in 1958 by Léon Monchin, who was incidentally a businessman. And uh, it's really been a place of incredible achievements. So more than 50% of its permanent professors won the highest prize in mathematics, the Fields Medal. So um, a very, very special place to be. Um, so it's set in the grounds of, an, of a demolished chateau and what you can see here is the old library building. And uh, every day when I lived there, I would walk up to the village and on my way to work, 
I I learned the French custom of saying bonjour to every stranger I passed in the street. Of course, if I knew someone, I also knew that I should walk up and say a few words and shake hands. But um, but I I quickly got the habit and enjoyed saying bonjour. And uh, one day I was walking up to the institute, and I was just saying bonjour to the gardener. But um, what I saw was uh, I thought a new a new gardener. And uh, he was right in the middle of the rose bush. He seemed to be pruning the rose bush and he was smelling the roses. And I thought, wow, this is a lucky man. He's landed his dream job. He really loves it here. So um, he was really enjoying himself. So I called out bonjour and he gave me a wonderful big smile back and said bonjour. And uh, off I went to my office and, um, and that was it. So um, the next day I got up early. It was, it was uh, mid June, I think, probably 1993. And uh, once again, I saw the new gardener there and I called out bonjour and I got an even bigger smile back, bonjour. And, um, and off I went to my office. And um, um, the intriguing thing was the very next day I went up there and he wasn't there. And I thought, mm, I don't know what happened to him. And, um, but I didn't think much about it. And um, uh, I went to lunch and lunch at IHS is a very special uh, event where um, it's kind of, I was told it was my main responsibility when I worked there was to turn up for lunch and tea. So we have this beautiful four course lunch and all the mathematicians gather and you, you, you have pe pens and paper pads and you all discuss. And I, I think you learn more at lunch than you do in, in any other uh, seminar or time you spend there. So, um, so, but there was the gardener sitting at lunch. And I thought, you know, this is just not normal. Who is this man? And what's he doing at lunch? And uh, so I caught his eye and I smiled, bonjour. And he, he sort of waved back at me. We weren't sitting right next together. And I said to the colleague next to me, I said, who is this man? And uh, they replied, oh, that's Raoul Bott. And I said, Raoul Bott? I spent years reading his books, but I never knew how he looked. Um, so he was this quite large and very friendly, um, dressed a little like a gardener uh, character, and he just exuded warmth and generosity. And uh, so I was just absolutely delighted to meet him face to face. In fact, I spent more than a year of my time at graduate school laboring page by page through a book that he wrote on differential forms and algebraic topology with Loring too. And it was just such a wonderful book. And I felt that I knew this man so well, but I just didn't recognize him. You know, I, it was just that the knowledge that was apparent from me passing through him in the gardens of IHS did not give me any clue to his whole identity. I guess this is a very important point, is that so much of what we need to know and understand about somebody is hidden from the visual um, or our sense, our immediate senses. And so, um, you know, we work, we see things, we process them, and then we come to some sort of conclusion. And uh, in my case of seeing Bot amongst the roses, um, enjoying himself, smelling the roses every day, I thought he must be a gardener. But in fact, he turned out to be um, this absolutely great, phenomenal mathematician that I admired and had no idea what he looked like. So um, if you don't know anything about Bot, um, he was born in uh, Budapest, Hungary in 1923. And he spent most of his career at Harvard, actually, as, um, as a professor there. And he was very renowned for his teaching. Um, in fact, um, his close co collaborator, Loring Tu, wrote about him. Bott's lectures are legendary for their seeming ease of comprehension. His style is typ typically the antithesis of the definition theorem proof approach, so favored among mathematical speakers. Usually, he likes to discuss a simple key example that encapsulates encapsulates the essence of the problem, often as if by magic, a concrete formula with transparent significance appears. So um, one famous quote, you know, but actually I really used to enjoy chatting with him. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2005, but, um, but I used to really enjoy chatting. He loved giving kind of advice out. And um, one of his famous quotes that you can even find on the web is the one I put on the screen. There are two ways to do great mathematics. The first way is to be smarter than everybody else. The second way is to be stupider than everybody else, but persistent. So um, I think that's an interesting way
to think about artificial intelligence. So um, you can either go about solving an application in artificial intelligence by trying to be really, really smart. And a few people can do that. But even for them, it's very limited what they can achieve. Whereas other people, um, you know, they, they need to find a different approach to solving these problems. And that really delineates the two approaches, the two main approaches that we have to problems in artificial intelligence. Um, so let's see. Uh, um, the first approach is what I mentioned. It's, um, it's traditional programming. It's coding. It's what you're used to thinking about um, computer scientists doing, um, at least for the novice. This is what we imagine computer scientists doing. They, they, they invent algorithms, um, highly intelligent procedural methods of breaking down a problem and, um, and giving answers. And so in this sense, the, uh, the coders put rules into the machine. The machine then processes data and gives you answers. And um, this has lots of applications. It's had uh, considerable early success in the field of artificial intelligence, but, it's, um, but it, it kind of reached a plateau. And, um, but this is a type of artificial intelligence we see applied in things like um, Deep Blue, you know, the, the computer program that beat uh, Kasparov at chess. Um, so this is called good old fashioned artificial, artificial intelligence or good old fashioned robotics. Um, so there's another form of uh, or approach to artificial intelligence, and that's the one that's been mentioned in the other talks is machine learning. And this is what's really taken off in the last uh, decade or two. And uh, th this is the study of computer algorithms, algorithms that improve automatically through experience. So they build a mathematical model um, based on sample data known as training data in order to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to do so. Um, this, um, so here you see, we kind of flip things around. We have, um, we have the answers and the data going as inputs and then some sort of rules coming in as outputs. But it's important to know that the type of rules that come out of this are not really the kind of rules that a human can understand. So I'll, I'll say something more about that in a moment. Um, so this is what I would call in, in bots uh, dichotomy, this, the stupid approach to artificial intelligence, but incredibly powerful. So um, basically you train the algorithm, not by clear symbolic representations and applications of logic, but by feeding it answers. However, what was impossibly difficult for good old fashioned artificial intelligence, that's GoFi, becomes child's play for methods like artificial neural networks. For example, you can train a neural network very quickly to surpass human competence in character recognition, providing you have, of course, large appropriate labeled data sets. And here you can see um, the National Institutes of Standards modified data set for, for uh, numerical characters. And to each one is attached a label. So you give the, the machine learning algorithm the labels and all the variations in your data set of the number five, and it learns how to recognize the number five. Um, so, um, now like any real intelligence, um, you have inputs, data and outputs, but in artificial intelligence, the outputs are not thoughts or ideas, but predictions. This is a simulation of intelligence by a statistical algorithm, not an exact function. And of course, by its very nature, it will make mistakes. The key is to further improve the model by giving it feedback on its success and failures, and of course, more training data. So, um, what you, if you try to look inside the black box, what you'll find in there is you'll find essentially a bunch of numbers. So it adjusts um, um, weights and biases to try to correlate um, the inputs with the desired outputs. And once you've done enough of that training, you can, with a fairly high degree of confidence, um, if you've set up the machine well, you can converge on a, um, on a reliable artificial intelligence system that can work in sort of, with a sort of narrow competence very well and uh, surpass uh, human ability. Um, but you still have a black box in essence. It's just a collection of numbers. There's no conceptual understanding, 
just answers, but no explanation. So um, to break it down e even further, if you're new to this stuff, you need to think of it as a mathematical function. It's like drawing a curve through a lot of data points. You can try to minimize the errors, but you'll never eliminate them. Also, the more complex the phenomena, the more helpful a statistical model may be, but also the more risk associated with its use, depending on how you intend to use the predictions. And this is the key point. So if you're just trying to identify characters or consumer products, uh, there's no harm in continuing to make mistakes. It's just an opportunity to improve. However, if you're trying to identify a target, an enemy combatant, a suspicious some suspicious behavior, a probable terrorist, a statistical algorithm can help, but only through suggestions, as it's only giving you leads for further investigation. So here is the main uh, point which I want to try to make. It's the fundamental mistake is to try to combine such a technology with lethal force, i.e. killer robots. It just doesn't make sense to ever use a statistical model to individual to, to, to make individual decisions which involve the taking of a life. I mean, that I hope in the way I presented it, that's fairly obvious. Um, now, none of us likes being a statistic. And worse than that, being killed as one. Well. Moreover, the problem is symmetric. You don't just have definite information. You don't have definite information about who will be killed by such a weapon. You, don't, you also don't have meaningful accountability. Um, and who should be the target of judicial redress. The only way out of this conundrum is not to legislate after the fact, but an outright ban before the fact. So um, just as I tried to explain with my first meeting of Rabot, all the most interesting aspects of this subject are private, uh, hidden dimensions of personality, character, knowledge. Now a lethal autonomous weapon can identify objects, but never subjects. It's categorically wrong to confuse the two. Um, now, I think I've run out of time, but, um, but and it, there is a sense in which if we take the step to the widespread deployment of or lethal autonomous weapons, we'll be making a mistake um, far greater, I believe, than introducing intercontinental ballistic missiles and, and, um, and weapons of mass destruction, because it's the delocalization of the kill zone that's happening. So uh, this is something that's unprecedented. I'll need another talk to explain it. And, um, but it's significantly more of a threat and more terrifying because delocalized lethal force is an unprecedented event in the history of the use of force, the use of lethal force against humans. So, um, I'll leave it with the founding document of Pugwash, the Russell Einstein Manifesto, which was signed by Einstein a few days before his death in 1955. And thus his life ended with the plea, but not with a formula. And the plea was, we appeal as human beings to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to a new paradise. If you cannot, there lies before you the risk of universal death. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, David. So we're going to move over to the questions now. Um, so I'm going to start from the bottom, just because I noticed a few at the top were already being answered. Um, so the first question is directed to Elizabeth. Um, does Article 36 plan to help op operationalize the CCW's guiding principles in order to achieve a law-specific set of guidelines which could be overlaid on and integrated with existing regulatory structures? Yeah, thanks for the question and I'm very glad you enjoyed the paper and analysis. It's always good to know that people are reading those things. <laughs> and um, I saw your question further up as well uh, to do with are we working on best practice uh, guidelines for, for weapons reviews. I think that was also from you, uh, for AI and machine learning um, and uh, guidelines on oversight and control. So I suppose, you know, as you know, from our point of view, we think optimally a new international legal instrument is what's needed. We think that's the thing that will be most sort of clarifying 
for countries and that this needs to be kind of a collective negotiation and on what are the principles for everyone in order to uphold our existing kind of legal, moral, ethical principles to work out what those are and for that to be, try to apply that kind of uniformly. Um, so, you know, the work that, that we're doing, um, as I'm sure you know, if you've read some of our papers, is more in the area of trying to draw out you know, questions and principles that can underpin this kind of negotiation, which we think is ultimately down to states. So to also address some other things that have come up in the chat as to, you know, what is meaningful human control and stuff like that. I mean, we've, we've written on the subject, so have a lot of other people and the campaign has a position um, on it to kind of talk about a few of those principles. So we talk about predictable, reliable and transparent technology uh, for you know, people who are using technology to know how it functions and what it's going to do. Uh, accurate information uh, on the outcome that is going to come from technology and the context of its use and timely human judgment and action in all these processes and processes for accountability. Uh, the campaign to stop killer robots talks about different components that could make up meaningful human control. So components in decision making uh, to make sure that humans who operate weapon systems have the kind of information and ability to make meaningful decisions within legal rules, uh, technological components that are embedded features that can enhance control and operational components to do with you know, where and when and how and against what weapon systems are, are used. So I think, you know, for us, uh, we would provide like this kind of analysis and suggestions of what should happen. And I think it would be best enshrined in a legal framework uh, that's international and that, you know, states can then use that in their national weapons review processes and guidelines. And that would be the most kind of effective way to go forward from our point of view. So hope that helps a bit. We, uh, in terms of operationalizing the guiding principles, so this is a terminology that is, um, for those who kind of don't follow this closely, has come up in the context of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. These guiding principles are 11 things that states agreed on to uh, you know, guide their work and discussions on lethal autonomous weapon systems. And the chair of the process this year has asked for comments on operationalizing them, which is, you know, what are your national interpretations of what these principles mean? So we kind of support countries to talk about what their opinions are on these different areas as the basis for those international rules. Thank you. So next question, which is directed to Laura, is whether lethal autonomous weapons would be preferable um, as defensive measures. So, you know, regarding uh, human error, for example, human speed is limited and humans can, of course, make many mistakes themselves. So wouldn't lethal autonomous weapons be preferable if we're talking about security? Yeah, um, so first off, um, defensive weapons, of, of autonomous and semi-autonomous defensive weapons already exist. Um, you look at things like the Aegis uh, defensive weapon system, which is installed on ships. It's got a semi-autonomous mode um, that basically, if, if, if the humans that are on the ship see that an attack is coming in, they can toggle, toggle it into autonomous mode and it can, it can uh, it can basically uh, shoot at any missiles or whatever that's coming in. So this, these are very, very different systems um, than, than the sort of uh, things like the Harpy that, that we were looking at. Um, first off, um, the, these are systems that are not proactively going out and seeking targets to attack. These are systems that are defending against incoming missiles. And they tend to be defending human beings because human beings tend to be co-located with these systems, um, which you know changes the the sort of the, the shape of the system very dramatically, right? You're, the, 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 there's a, a reasonable moral uh, basis for shooting down missiles that are coming into a ship full of humans, I think, right? Um, and that's very different to something like a harpy that is going out and seeking out uh, radar signals to attack. So uh, anyway, so in, in, uh, the other point as well is in terms of meaningful human control, generally speaking, these systems, um, they, they sit there, somebody is sitting with them all the time, looking at radars and whatever things, and the, that system will only be activated into autonomous mode briefly uh, when it's really needed. So it, it, that's, that's, uh, that is something that I would consider to be very much meaningful human control. So first off, I would characterize these systems as not offensive weapons in the same way as, as most of the ones that we're trying to ban are. They're defending human lives and they're usually and they're under meaningful human control usually and 
uh, for those reasons, I think they're, they're not what we're trying to ban, basically. I think Elizabeth would probably have some, some input on this one as well. Yeah, I mean, just to add what Laura's saying, very much agree. And, um, you know, the kind of key thing for us is to do with the level of human control, uh, rather than whether, you know, a system is, is defensive or, you know, the area in which it's used. It's like, what degree of control do, do people have over it? And, you know, I think as part of this international discussion process, um, it's helpful to look at existing weapon systems and for, you know, countries and all of us and others to consider thinking through why do we allow certain things at the moment and you know what things have we prohibited and what are the reasons around kind of control and ethics that we that we've done certain things and one reason why you know we're okay with missile defense systems at the moment is because they operate under very tight parameters of control it doesn't say that you know there haven't been problematic incidents in relation to them and that perhaps that's something we should look at but there's there's a reason why we permit those kind of systems but others which decrease control and increase autonomy or target people in a more specific way are so troubling in the space, which is not to endorse any existing weapon system, obviously. So the next question um, seems to be, well, anyone can answer it, but it seems to be quite implicitly geared towards uh, you, Elizabeth, is that is regarding the Geneva Additional Protocol of 1977, Article 36. Um, as to whether that is a sufficient instrument with regards to lethal autonomous weapons. Um, do you have any response to that? Uh, well, I saw there was some quite useful material in the, in the chat that Tanya added. Um, I think just to say as well, as I said in my kind of previous um, remarks, we think that really a kind of inter a collective international response is needed on this, right? So it's true that most states are party to additional protocol one that they have these obligations to review new weapons means and methods of warfare that they bring into a service to kind of check if they're legal or if they wouldn't meet existing principles but there's very little information on how countries do these reviews um, you know we know that a lot of countries don't do do very much on them some um, release information about the process they use, but there's not very much transparency there. And we don't know kind of basically what the, the quality of a lot of this, this work is. So we think it would be much more kind of clear and straightforward if there was an international negotiation. Um, and at the moment, I mean, I suppose, you know, you can look back at um, other weapon systems, which we have subsequently identified as problematic and had to prohibit through international treaties they at one point did pass Article 36 reviews, so it's possible that in some way this you know, isn't necessarily always sufficient and it can, it can miss things, as well as the technical issues that, that can come up with them, which were elaborated in the chat as well, of the um, difference between you know, testing data and actual outcomes and, and operations. So we're called Article 36, but it's um, you know, not because we necessarily promote this process, but because we want to look at the weapons and their acceptability in, in general. So it's a bit of a you know joke name. Good. The next question: um, Could we could we rely on lethal Thomas weapons to go wrong in some public way before there will be sufficient international pressure for action? And that seems to be open to all. Well, um, I suspect some of the other speakers may have something to say about this as well. But what I will say is. Um, I think it's very, very difficult, especially when you have these very, very complex weapon systems to to know how well that they are performing. Um, and particularly in war zones, it's not easy to get good uh, a good a good view of what's happening in detail. Uh, there's very, very many excellent investigative journalists who spend an awful lot of time going out there and, and trying to get information about what's happened in in, in warfare, but fundamentally that that information is not easy to come by so it's going to be very difficult to to make that case against autonomous weapons uh, from the outside without having the, the the technical information and the information on, on their operation that the um that the, the militaries that are operating them are going to have yeah does it do you want to answer as well Elizabeth? well i would just say i suppose i hope not and that um you know i hope that given that we know the issues and the developments that are on the table and what is happening, that we can kind of address this in 
uh, sufficient time politically, which is, yes, why we need action from all of us in the campaign and others who are you know, interested in being involved as well. Do you have anything to add on as well, David? Can everybody hear me? Okay, I was just wanted to add that it would be intelligent if we could avoid uh, waiting for some catastrophe to happen before we take action. So I think this is an opportunity to exercise our human intelligence. I guess I'll ask a follow up question to um, David actually. Um, there is an argument um, that by basically banning lethal autonomous weapons, that would be in some way preventing the development of artificial intelligence. What would you say to that sort of argument? Uh, you're saying that it might impede uh, progress in artificial intelligence? I, I mean, as far as I understand the subject, um, I think we shouldn't be afraid if we're able to legislate against uses, applications like um, lethal autonom autonomous weapons, then I think we shouldn't be afraid of artificial intelligence any more that we're, than we're afraid of trucks or, um, or forklifts or something like that. I mean, they complement human ability. And, uh, and I think that uh, they will enrich our lives. We have to make sure that we don't use them as an excuse to become lazy. Um, and in fact, one of the biggest problems to solve in the world is that we have um, things to do that we enjoy. So if artificial intelligence can progress in applications, in peaceful, productive applications, where they enhance our life and allow us to do more productive and difficult things that we enjoy doing, rather than more rote, boring things that we don't enjoy doing, then they'll be adding enormously to our, um, to our, uh, our well-being. So, um, so I don't think it's a problem at all in banning them. I think it's just stupid to ever go ahead with making them. And this is a chance to, to really show some human intelligence and get ahead of the curve. And we rarely do that, but, um, but you know, it's a new millennium, let's try. So that's my point of view. Yeah, thank you. So there's a question for Elizabeth. Um, in your presentation, you reiterate the difference between laws, lethal autonomous weapons relevant to our current discussion, and the Terminator style sensational form that is portrayed by the media. However, do you think it's valuable to use this Terminator form to promote discussion on this area, given how attractive this image may be, despite it being a bit misleading? Yeah, that's... That's a good question about how do we, you know, kind of engage people and show show what we talk about. I mean, I suppose we, you know, we, we do get a lot of media interest uh, on this issue and it is partly because of, you know, it immediately conjures up the idea of the Terminator and of advanced artificial intelligence that might wipe us all out and a lot of those kind of sci-fi stories that we all kind of have watched and uh, engaged with. Um, I mean, if that's people's entry points, that's fine. But I think it's, you know, for the policy discussion, obviously that's not where we want to focus and we want to be much more kind of proximate and realistic and, you know, not sensational in, in what we're talking about. And uh, I mean, as we've seen in this seminar tonight, kind of communicating exactly what we are worried about, what we're talking about and the range of technologies can be quite, quite complex, right? So finding um, clear, clear entry points to that is, is important. Um, I mean, it's the, the Terminator, I think, will inevitably be around on this issue and will draw people in, uh, but it's our challenge to make sure we you know, explain what this is really about and that we need to act now because that's something very, very far horizon. And um, just as a, an, an extra aside on, on the Terminator as, as we're on it, um, a, a few states in the international discussion uh, have a very kind of high tech definition of what is a lethal autonomous weapon system. So they might say that, you know, we don't want to develop these lethal autonomous weapon systems and we'll never do that. But they define them as basically something that is the Terminator. So a technology that has the ability to understand its environment and to have higher level intent to make decisions. Um, this has appeared in the discourse of, uh, for example, Germany and also the UK and, you know, primarily anti-personnel weapons. Um, you know, this isn't sort of what we're talking about in terms of our immediate concern. Um, and it's kind of easier to try and put the concern 
out over there so we don't have to engage with the more urgent things and the regulations over these systems and meaningful human controls that we need. Uh, but it's interesting that they, they feature. So the next question um, is whether STEM students should take ethics courses. So um, if someone wants to take the floor first. Talk about this a little bit. I think, um, I absolutely think, I think that, well, I actually ty typed in the chat, I think everyone should take ethics courses and I think that is absolutely true. Um, I think we all, we all run across ethical dilemmas in our work, whether or not we're in business, whether we're in medicine, whether we're in technology. Um, and I, th I think and, and eth ethics can't tell you what to do or what, what your values should be, but they can give you a framework to think about it more clearly. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's also a very useful framework for, for public discourse about issues as well. So I think, yes, I think everyone should study ethics for, for several reasons. <laughs> Would there, would there be anyone else that would want to answer this question? David or Elizabeth, if you have any opinions on whether STEM students should take ethics courses? I mean, I think, uh, yes, of course they should. Um, I mean, it's a problem that of our education system that in the same way, a lot of artificial intelligence research now is focused on what's called narrow artificial intelligence. It's training up an algorithm to do something very well, but very specific. That's often the way our education system functions, especially higher education. Um, so, uh, so I think that we do need to broaden everybody's education. And uh, whether you're a theoretical physicist or a musician, I do think that understanding more about society and, and ethics and how we, uh, the sort of options that we have for society is very important to, to open up our minds and at least bring that into the discussion and that won't happen in specialist tuition. Yep um, I mean I also agree with that and that all of us in all our areas of work you know it's important for us to think through the implications of what we're doing just not, not in our narrow not only in the narrow area that we're working in but in you know sort of more broadly um, in terms of the implications. Oh, sorry, I'll hand back to you. I think you were gonna ask some other questions, Yolanda. Um, oh, there seems to be one more question. So yeah, so a question from Pamela. In the GGE on lethal autonomous weapons, there seems to be a terminology debate, meaningful human control, human judgment, human involvement, are all concept interchangeable or are there nuances from the AI point of view? Or the technical AI point of view. These these are not technical concepts. Uh, these are concepts that have evolved in this debate, and these are political con these are political terminologies. Uh, so human judgment and human control that, that that's a huge amount. That's very very contentious. Um, human judgment comes from the U.S. Um, DOD Directive 3000.09, which talks about um, lethal autonomous weapons and they, they would say, well, it, it, it forbids them. Um, what it says is that uh, you need to maintain human judgment in the, um, in the use of force. Um, the question is, what, what does appropriate human judgment mean? I mean, as, as, as a military commander, it might be my judgment that it's perfectly fine to go out and send 100 loitering munitions to patrol the desert. Um, does that mean that I have control of them? No, it does not. So they're not, they're not the same thing. Elizabeth probably has things to say about this, I don't think. I think that was a very good answer. I mean, just to second what Laura was saying, um, this is, you know, yes, these are political terms in the context of the political negotiation, uh, rather than um, think, you know, terms that exist from a technological point of view. Um, they have certain uh, content to the people that are using them. I mean, meaningful human control is something that was coined by the civil society as, as a term to structure discussions so um, quite a few countries are uncomfortable with using that for, for those and other reasons. Um, some of these terms might be used in order to uh, move away from an idea of, of control uh, which we feel is sort of a stronger term and can apply to these systems over the whole sort of cycle of their design and use to something like involving judgment or involvement you know, you might see as something a, a little bit weaker in terms of the, the role of, of the human uh, in that and which in the debate can concede a little bit more to arguments about the sort of positives of these systems uh, and that kind of thing. And I think just to say, 
similarly, you know, this is political in a similar way that the argument Orlando bro uh, brought up about uh, dual uses. So, you know, would banning killer robots uh, be bad for developments in AI for, for other reasons? I think this is often also, you know, this is a genuine question, but it's also uh, deployed as a political argument against regulation. I mean, if you draft a treaty that is effective, to maintain meaningful human control over the use of force and uh, elaborate the components of that. There's no reason why this should influence other uses of AI that aren't covered by the scope of the treaty. And as Laura said in the chat, the Chemical Weapons Convention <laughs> didn't ban chemistry. Uh, there are ways to do legal framings and to work out these issues so that you can, you can manage those things. Okay, so I'm going to ask one last question just because I see there's no more new questions. Um, so this is directed actually to you, Elizabeth. Um, so obviously I'm very interested in the political angle towards lethal autonomous weapons. And you earlier mentioned that there isn't much attention towards strategic stability with regards to lethal autonomous weapons. So I was wondering whether you would think that whether you would think that that would be a useful leverage perhaps in this sort of negotiation debate to have these more powerful military states um, somewhat concede a bit more, would be a bit more at ease. I mean, I think it, it definitely would be helpful to have more kind of thought through discussion in that area. Um, I think at the moment, quite a few countries are pursuing these technologies, uh, you know, in order to gain a strategic edge over others. Uh, but there isn't so much kind of discussion given to the risks in that. I mean, it's something that, you know, we raise as a campaign and some talk about, but I don't feel it's been given sort of very serious attention even within in the CCW at the moment. So I feel that that could be helpful and could be, you know, states negotiate arms control agreements between themselves for exactly these reasons if they don't want that to kind of get, get out of control, right? So it should, should be a motivator. Um, but the discussion is not there right now, even though I think in technological terms, it's not equal in terms of the states that are interested in these technologies and developing them. I think we can already see who might win that, that particular race. Uh, so there should be more incentive really to be, to be negotiating for control on these weapon systems. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We're going to wrap it up here, but thank you for everyone that's watching. And of course, thank you as well for the participants. It was a really good talk. Um, we will be sending out the slides after the talk to everyone. So if you want to go through in your own time, you'll very much be able to do so. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. Bye.